on this wet, 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 very wet day. Ugh, I know, right? So uh, before we jump into it, uh, we got a lot of logistics to run through, so we'll knock them out very quickly. One, you have your wellness day tomorrow, so do go relax, enjoy the thunderstorms that are supposed to, you know, hit. If you're new to North Carolina, welcome to hurricane season. Uh, The other little bit there is, you know, check in with family and friends or do whatever you need to do to just kind of clear your mind. You also just had a problem set due, right? Yeah. You know what that means. You know what that means, especially since I've been dangling that carrot uh, over you for so much. You have not only a problem set, but also a lecture exercise. I know. So again, the lecture exercise is due in one week. The problem set is due in two weeks. Uh, I'll go ahead and jump into the problem, uh, the lecture exercise. Uh, this, we're going to be speeding uh, today's, that's what we're talking about in today's lecture, is uh, about constraint-based uh, programming and linear programming. Uh, but the entire idea is, hey, I'm giving you a file, and it's your job to, you know, work through it, play around with it, uh, understand what all of this stuff is. Again, we'll talk about all of these things uh, today. Uh, and then, hey, build your own, right? You're a shoemaker. Uh, okay, what's the optimal configuration of what types of uh, shoes you should be making to maximize your profit? Uh, again, we'll talk about this today, uh, so not needing to worry too much on that. The other thing uh, is, again, like I said, you had a problem set due uh, today, so that means we have another problem set to be offering you. And today's problem set is... That linear assignment problem, you know, the thing that we've been talking about, I, we touted around, that's the simulated annealing genetic algorithms thing. Well, hey, I built, I just kind of made some fancy graphic visualization this time, but optimize. What's the optimal configuration for this, what is that, four, what is it, this nine uh, by nine linear assignment problem? What's the optimal configuration of people to when I was picking fonts, there, there isn't a good font for, like, jobs. So, I don't know, fruit. What's the optimal configuration of person to fruit? I'm a pineapple person myself, but I do like myself a watermelon. Anyways, uh, the same as before. Again, you'll, you have access to all of these materials. That's the uh, uh, lecture exercise. Uh, and you're being tasked. Some of these we'll be bringing up today. Here's the lecture exercise that you'll need to be working on. Uh, You can see it doesn't work because there's parts that you have to build, right? Uh, The other part is, again, just like before with the problem set, you have your visualized simulation that you can be working off of. Uh, This time, though, it is not considered a robot. It is called Configuration Solver. It's still an agent. It's still the thing you're working off of. Instead of get action, I now call it update search, right? Again, because if you think about what we were talking about with linea- uh, with the simulated annealing algorithm, with the genetic algorithm, uh, genetic uh, algorithm as well, what we were getting at is we can just keep going forever, right? We're iteratively optimizing. So there's an infinite number of steps. So... Here you go. This is that update search. Uh, You're tasked with doing a little better than random. Don't just do a random search. We are going to review your code. And if you just do a random search, well, I'm going to give you a 40% deduction. Why? Because you can technically solve problem set three with random search. But that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to solve the problem. I'm asking you implement one of the algorithms that we've done in class. I don't know. I gave you two. I keep saying two algorithms. I don't know. Simulated annealing, genetic algorithm. Implement them. It's like I gave you the pseudocode for a good reason. Uh, some of this you can keep. Some of this you, you should obviously update. But it's just a, a hodgepodge of here's what a random search would look like. Uh, that's 
your job. You do not need to mess around with this get best configuration method. This is what we're pulling. So you're going to do the search side. You're not telling me the answer. You're just telling me what your current configuration is, right? Because you want to, just like you can see here, you want to keep track of your best possible configuration, right? That's your best possible configuration. But you should still be having the version for your search. That's where, notice, that's coming from. Uh, so this method, again, as you can clearly see, it's just, hey, give the environment your best configuration that you've seen so far. Uh, same as always, you've got your inputs this time. Instead of it being a full-on map, it's a text file. So, you know, if you're feeling froggy about taking this entire approach and maybe implementing it, right, give it a shot. Uh, the visualize does what a visualization does. You can see I do have some outputs as well, so you can see what your thing is doing. Po you know, slow it down if you want. Uh, but there you go. You can see, hey, it's tracking your best score as well. You know, oh, you're welcome, right? Uh, the last part with this, I will go ahead and say, even though your input five, you know, that fifth test case, even though it's a nine uh, by nine problem, the hidden test cases go bigger, right? The, we go, I think, up into 15 and 20, or I think the biggest one is 15. Uh, if you were to sit down and do the math uh, on how many is that? Yeah, optimal configurations. I should put this somewhere else. But the optimal configuration in a 15 by 15 linear assignment problem, it's, you know, big. It's problematic. Again, this is why we have some timeouts set up and whatnot. Because that's, what is that? That's thousands, millions, billions. That's a trillion, right? 1.3 trillion possible permutations. I'm not running your, 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 your submission for however many hours it would take for that to run, because I'm, right, OK? So again, work through some uh, different configurations. You do have the optimal calculations as well. So you can sort of see, you know, again, hey, for that input one, right, this is the best you're going to get. You're, the best score you can possibly get is that 134. Uh, for environment two, I'd make that one a little bit more uh, uh, straightforward. There's only, there is one possible optimal configuration, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you can see in this case, uh, it's 450. I don't give you the visualizations, but that's mostly because Google uh, Sheets gets ugly when you try and uh, ask for, you know, millions of configurations. But the biggest one for environment three is 804, 754, 787, or 85. The last little part I'll get into before we'll jump into today's lecture is, obviously, how are you going to be evaluated? Should you be fighting for that global maxima? Well, that's, uh, we already said, you know, again, if you review or you remember simulated annealing, you don't know theoretically what that is. And so in our case, to pass a test case, to pass one of the inputs, your environment, I want something above the median. That's it. Just, hey, the median of all the configurations in this case is 100 for input one, I want you to do a little better. Just give me a little better, a little bit better than that. Uh, let's see, for problem set two or um, uh, environment two, I am expecting the optimal configuration from that one just because it's built that way uh, that you should really be doing it. But you can see, hey, here's the median for uh, test three. Do a little better. Do a little bit better than the median. Not terribly difficult. Again, work through. Of the two algorithms, I would strongly suggest simulated annealing. That'll make your life just so much easier. You're welcome. Yeah. Questions on lecture exercise or problem set? Simulated annealing. Simulated annealing. One of my 
fastest growing YouTube videos? I don't know why. <laughs> but with that out of the way, we will go ahead and jump on into the configuration satisfaction problems. So this, is, again, we're, we're still in this land of traditional artificial intelligence, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's outdated. It means that it takes a look at problems in a different light. And so I'm going to ask, or I'm going to provide you with a new type of problem. This is known as colorability. I have a graph, right? That looks like a graph-like structure. Well, I want to take these little circles here, and I want to give them a color, and specifically red, blue, or green. Can I map a color to each one of these circles such that no color has a neighbor that has the same color? So if this is red, this cannot be red, this cannot be red. If this is red, none of those can be red. Can I do it? Yes, I can. Oh, all right, fine. You know, and you may have been, you sat down and done like, you know, some mental uh, gymnastics in your head there. It would have worked, right? All right. Do your mental gymnastics again. Can I do it with red, blue, green? You don't have a laptop, but yes, yes, you can, right? And in fact, uh, this has another term as well uh, out there in the world. It is the map one. There it is. Map colorability. Where's the wiki? Just, there it is. Fine. Graph coloring. Where's the map version? I want there, right? So again, uh, like I was saying, it's known as, it also goes by the name of map colorability uh, in the entire idea. As you can see, like if I have a map, right, this is a, no different than the tile-based world, right? I have a node. There's us. And it just has Neighbors, four neighbors, those are connected. Those are also nodes. And that same question, hey, if I'm trying to draw, uh, you know, different areas or territories on a map, can I do it in such a way that I wouldn't be confusing anyone by having North and South Carolina be the same color, right? Then it would only be Carolina. Uh, so, again, this idea is what we're looking for. And the problem with this, right, this, this type of problem is that there is no solution. There's no po simulated annealing isn't quite going to work. Uh, the genetic not going to quite work. Uh, nothing. The only thing you can possibly do is an exhaustive search, yeah, right? But... I, I, I kind of lie there. There aren't approaches. There are approaches to this. And in fact, that's what we're looking at today is this idea of, well, hey, how do, we, how do we try and even structure this formally so that we can then take that and turn it into a program that we solve, right? That's what we're trying to look at here. So when we look at this idea, here's where we're going to go full just... You know, if you've ever met that professor and you're just like, they're a space cadet, right? We're about to go full space cadet for a second. We are creating our own universe when we deal with a problem. That's, you know, how I like to visualize this. And so what we're dealing with is, well, hey, what are my variables? What are the things that I'm going to be changing the entire time? But, all right, those are just the things I'm changing. Well, the other little aspect, the other little element to this is, I'm calling it domains. Another way you can think about it is dimensions, right? Think, again, this is where that space cadet kind of world is coming in. We're building our own universe. If we build our own universe, how many dimensions are we working from? Well, how many options am I providing you? Right? And that's where this comes into play. Well, you know, in the example, red, green, blue. Each one of those were a possible option for every single one of the variables when I was dealing with my nodes. But then I have one final section here. 
and that's my constraints. What are the rules of this universe that I'm creating, right? What, what is not allowed to happen? And again, when we think universe, we're not thinking about it in the real world sense where gravity exists, right? We're, we're thinking about it in the mathematical sense, something that I could program sense. And what we're trying to do is we are trying to find some mapping of these domains or these dimensions to my variables such that they don't violate any of the rules such that they don't violate any of the rules that I have established within my constraints. Again, that's that idea that, you know, none of my neighbors should be matching the same color as me. So as we're starting to build this out, right, as we're starting to flesh out, oh, I'm drawing and I'm putting these things together, hey, well, again, I happen to have, if we looked at that original uh, graphic, I was dealing with six nodes. I'm using C for this, you know, for whatever reason, N1, C1, X, well, whatever, right? I have six nodes that don't have a relationship, that don't have a connection, just six you know, you do node, node equals new node. Ta-da, I did that six times. But then I've got my configurations, my, my dimensions or my domains that I can be working from. And in this case, like I've said, I've established them as red, blue, and green. Just three possible variables that are values that I could be working from, right? Does it have to be three? No, it could be a billion. Does it have to be a billion? No, it could be one. Well. It, Preferably more than one. <clears throat> but then finally, I get to the constraints. And this is where I'll go ahead and, you know, give you a little spoiler here. You know, we have to forcibly do each one of these. We have to, you know, actually say, oh, you know, that node C1 cannot equal C2. And notice what forms from this. I built an edge because there's a relationship between my two nodes suddenly. And when we are dealing with graph-like structures, right, this is a way that we can now view them or model them is by saying, oh, well, hey, that's a relationship. And if every one of the relationships I'm going to establish in my graph are this whole not equal rule or constraint, right, C1 also can't equal C. Three, C1 cannot equal C5. C3 cannot equal C5. C2 cannot equal C4, right? So I can start to map the entire thing out. Now, yes, you can see I have the blurb there, right? We are going to be able to reduce this later, later. Yes? Is C2 not equal to C4? What was the other part? It's on there twice. It's on there twice. It is not supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to. I swear I'm a professional. There. So why we kind of mention this? Okay, map colorability. That, that, okay, fine. But you, your, your college students, you've, had to do a, a fun thing where it's, you know, fight people to get into this class. I've seen your emails, right? And, and uh, well, that's actually a version of this. That's a real world version of, of the constraint satisfaction problem. Room scheduling or just scheduling problems in general are a style of this type of problem. Here's just an example of a few classes, art, English, computer science, math, and because I have a theater degree, theater. Yeah, that's where it's all coming from. But my point is you notice that, hey, there's a starting point and there's an ending point. And my question becomes, well, hey, given this class structure, these classes at these times or these availabilities, how many rooms do I need to make sure I don't have any, you know, conflicts. Because if you notice, hey, well, if we looked at art, art is starting at, what is it, 9, 9, and ends at 10. And I'm going to shrink that down just for the sake of 
our sake, and, but then I also have English. And visually, the reason why I'm doing this is think about what I see here. It starts at 9.30 and ends at 10.30. I suddenly have an overlap. So when you're thinking about this from physical rooms, like, again, think about just this room. No other class can be happening at the same time as 4.11, right? Because that would just be, yes, we have another desk and we could have dueling lecturers, but I'm sure you, the class, would be complaining. Uh, so again, how, can, you know, how many classes do I need is what I can look at that colorability problem. Instead of it being three colorability, it becomes an in colorability scheduling problem. So that same thing comes into play, right? In this case, I'm establishing the variables being art, computer science, math, English, and theater. But then it's what room are they going to be working off of? And I, I keep it very generic in this say, uh, sense because, again, we don't know how many dimensions I can have quite yet. Do I need five? Or do I, can I get away with four? Well, if I can get away with four, can I get away with three? If I can get away with three, can I get away with two? Right? If I can get away with two, can I get away with a one? <laughs> right? And so, again, if we're thinking about the constraints, well, there's a relationship happening here. These two are overlapping. Well, that's going to mean that art cannot equal English, right? That becomes one of my constraints suddenly. Then if I look, math and computer science, they also had a, a similar overlap, I think, with uh, 11 and 11.30. So CSC is not going to be able to equal math either. And there we go. So now we can kind of do the mapping part. We can do the, the, the brute force exhaustive search. What are all the possible permutations that I can configure? And in our case, yes, we can do it with three colors. Can I get away with something smaller? I see you, Bob. Two. How? How? How two? Oh, all right, fine. <laughs> yeah, I could get rid of my blue, and I can, you know, just make English and theater uh, also green. And that also works. Perfect. Great. But what if I get a more complicated schedule? If I start to have more overlaps suddenly? that same kind of process is going to happen, right? I just established more constraints. I'm not going to draw them all. But you can see English and art can't, uh, can't have the same class. Uh, art and math can't. Math and computer science and computer science with English or theater. OK, well, again, can I do it with five classes? Yes, absolutely, right? Each class gets their own individual room, and we're done. But the problem is, and this is from now like a business financial standpoint, rooms cost money. Right? They are, you're, you're taking up resources, and money can be time, space, or financial costs. That becomes a major issue, right? So what do we do? Right? Well, you're, this isn't the only class that appears in this classroom, right? So we go, OK, can I shrink it down to four? And yes, I can, right? Oh, hey, right? I can. I can still map out every single one of these variables in a smaller constraint, uh, constraint space. And so, hey, I've just saved myself a room. That room can go for whatever purpose, right? But can I do it in three? And yes, again, I can get away with it in three. Uh, you know, theater is kind of ruining all of us. Uh, everything, theater just ruins everything. Uh, don't, don't, <laughs> right? So again, I had to have three rooms at time. Could I do it in two? No, there's no physical way uh, to do that. And, you know, hey, maybe let me just try all the different possible. Con no, none of them work, right? None of those configurations are going to allow me. So what have I deduced? The minimum number of rooms that I need is three to have this possible mapping. 
Now, right, you go space cadet, no, not space cadet, not yet with that. Uh, just think about what you have to do here at NC State, right? NC State has how many buildings with how many rooms and how many classes across how many, right? Now you understand why sometimes you have to have an 8 a.m. class or that night class because just to configure it all is a, 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 a nightmare. And in fact, <laughs> you can make a business out of this. PeopleSoft, this is their entire, you know, they're owned by Oracle now, but PeopleSoft, the entire job uh, uh, was, of, you know, optimizing scheduling of rooms. That's it, like, because it's that important of a job. So, you know, if you want to go out there in the world and, I don't know, make money, fight Oracle, you know, compete against Oracle. <laughs> Don't, don't, please, they're an e-partner, I think. I don't know, are they? Whatever, moving on. You know what that means, right? Okay, well, take this room scheduling constraint satisfaction problem. And once you know it, linear assignment can also be mapped the exact same way. So you've got your in workers, you've got your in jobs. Tell me what the X, D, and C are for the linear assignment problem. Uh, I'll give you five minutes. So we'll come back at 3.32. And we are back, everyone. Let me see how you did. That's all from last class. So let's take a look, see what we got going on here. 16. All right. So let's see. We've got a few different versions. Uh, so the one thing I'll say here, because you can see this is actually uh, the great kind of point of this. So with the linear assignment problem, with specifically like this whole mapping one thing to another, right? which one's the variable, which one's the... Again, if we're thinking about the linear assignment problem, yes, right, that open question. Thankfully, this is, you know, this is a much more a way of thinking rather than a specific programming style, right? Which things are you going to be serving as your variable, right? If we're looking at sort of this version down here, they removed the concept of like the, the color associated to the person. It's just like, oh, worker one, worker two, worker three. Those are the you know, things that are going to be the variable. And then the values that could possibly be there are the jobs, right? So both of those work out. The one thing I will say, just because I see it, don't get lazy. I know you want to, you know, you want to kind of use, you don't want to write out every single one of those things, but you, look at that, you got to, remember, think about this from a programming perspective, right? Think about what you as a programmer know to do when you write this in Java or whatever language you choose to do. You can't write that, right? You can't write one job per person or one job to one, you know you can't do that, right? You got to have your if statements. You've got to have these built out in some way, and you have to traverse through them, and they are Boolean checks. So, yes, even though, you know, this is me just kind of dinging you, right? Again, it's not the end of the world. I get what you're doing. You're trying to shortcut yourself. Don't, don't shortcut yourself. Don't know the format? Here's the format. No, but okay, so good. Uh, so far, so good. That's fine. But again, like I was saying, you know, before I handed it off to you, right, what happens when we translate this into the real world? Well, again, I'm just giving you, I know I, I kind of said it and explained it with NC State, but you can just expand that, right? What happens when you start having 
more classes happening at the same time, right? I, I only mapped it from like, you know, just different rooms to different uh, uh, things. But what if I, you know, add time as a complexity or as a dimension to this problem, right? I'm only saying, hey, history is going to be in room, uh, you know, room, think building. Building also works, right? You're not going to, uh, which one has gives us cancer? Pool? Yeah. Poe. Poe Hall, right. Right. You know, so the history people are in Poe Hall. We're here in EB2, right? So again, right, think about that. It's buildings, times, days, each one of those adds to the complexity of the problem. But if you can map it out like this, it's fine, right? So why we kind of present this, uh, you know, as we're kind of starting to build this out is we are always trying to reduce the number of dimensions or the domains of our problem. Because if it is an infinite number of possible options, right? This is, again, where we think about the continuous versus uh, discrete options that you were given when you were dealing with your problem set, too, right? If you thought about what I could or what you had to do, mm -hmm. Here's your agent, right? Again, think about what I asked you to return back. Just an action that can either move in one of the four cardinal directions. Again, why? Because that makes your dimensions. That makes D four. Rather, I don't want to use you. But if you've played any form of game or you've done any form of game development, right, I could have also worked off of that circle that you all learned about in geometry with angles, right? Hey, move this direction. Or if that wasn't, so, you know, move. Oh, I, gotta, I don't want to ruin move. That direction. Or, oh, you know, if you can't tell the difference, put it in the middle between the two of them. Or, so, again, right, you could have had technically an infinite number of possible degrees as you slowly turned across. That becomes a major issue. Uh, and, in fact, you know, when we present everything in this class, we focus on trying to discretize the moves because it makes all of our lives easier when we're trying to learn these things rather than the big, ugly, infinite number of searching that, you know, then just every one of your algorithms is hitting an infinite loop. And so, again, we'll, we'll see these over uh, again and again, but we're looking at this method of trying to provide a distinct number. Rather than this amorphous, theoretical, infinite number of options, we want something that to be a definitive number of options. Uh, Again, there's my explicit, right? So here's an example of that. Let's say we're taking the airport uh, that you did for your lab exercise too, right? Tiny, not everything. Kind of, you know, again, we're kind of missing this area uh, of the United States, right? We, we probably need at least one airport there. Now, this is where we got to remove just like the actual real world for a second. Don't think about... Phoenix or San Francisco or, or LAX. Don't think about real ones, right? But where would I put an airport here? How do I even start to try and optimize this properly, like get it into a good configuration, right? Well, one way you could do it is you could look at this in that two-dimensional space. And now it's a matter of, well, hey, again, this is where the, the difference between discretized options and continuous options start to come into play. If I went discretized, I could just kind of work off of like, you know, my x-axis, right? You notice very explicitly. Oh, okay, well, you, you, I'm missing some of these. Great, okay, fine. We could zero it in. But now we're starting to lean into discretization, right? Now I'm only op offering fractions of steps, and, you know, yes, I'm only putting four here, but you, you know, like, you know, one-tenth or one-twenty-fifth or one-fourth, right? 
or I can go even further, right? So I could keep on doing this forever, right? I could just keep on going forever and ever and ever. And the issue, again, if you're thinking about this from computer science land, is the branching factor <sighs> explodes. That becomes a major issue from like a, a, an efficiency standpoint. So, you know, again, we try and do discretization. This is me saying that exact same thing helps reduce it. But I want to go ahead and now introduce linear programming. And yes, this lecture during the spring typically happens around Girl Scout cookie time. I'm not changing it for y'all. Right? Because <laughs> it's fun, all right? So, hey, you know, everything that we've just been doing with the whole variables, changing the values, adding constraints, that's the big important one, Another way you can map those, especially if we start to try and take what we're doing or we did the first half of this lecture, another way we could map them is by pulling out a little bit of your math class, right? You, you, you've seen that word before. I know, from math. What if I could represent these things as linear inequalities? Ooh, big fan, ooh. Well, what's that going to form? It's going to form a convex hull that we have as now our searchable space. What do I mean? Well, let's get off of this and look at some pi pictures of cookies. We're going to sell two types of cookies. The creme de la creme, the best of the best, the only cookie that matters, the Thin Mint. And then we're also going to sell the one you didn't even know existed, the shortbread. The trefoil, the basic, right? But we're just, okay, you know, fine. We're just working off of two because I'm demonstrating this. I'm helping you learn about them, right? One's clearly better than the other. It's that one. Either way, I have thin mints and trefoils that I want to sell. Fair enough, okay. But now let's contextualize that even further. Well, you know, when I'm selling these, again, you, you, when you sell Girl Scout cookies, it's to raise you know, money for your troop. Uh, so, okay, for every box that we sell, uh, the trefoils, you know, they don't, it's shortbread. There's, you know, profit margin is terrible on, whatever, right? We'll get 25 cents. For every box that the troop sells, they get 25 cents for the trefoils. However, the Thin Mints, they know, they know, right? That, eh. you get 30 cents for every Thin Mint box you sell. Okay, fine. Well, you know, I go to my house, I go to my garage, and I see that I got 500 boxes of Thin Mints and 500 boxes of trefoils. I need to get them out of my garage. But the problem is my minivan or my SUV or whatever vehicle you happen to just be choosing is only capable of holding 800 of those boxes. So I now have this weird, ugly problem where I have a 1,000 boxes of cookies, but I can only bring 800 boxes around me to the various grocery stores so that you can purchase them. Now what do I do? Well, this is welcome to business school. You didn't know this was business school. I want to maximize my profits. Now, yes, you've all done the mental gymnastics already. Oh, just sell all the Thin Mints and then whatever's left, you know, the shortbread thing, right? I get it, right? Okay, let's program at it. Let's show that rather than just like you doing it in your head. So what we're doing as we kind of, kind of build this out and think about this from a linear programming perspective is we are establishing the same rules that we've been dealing with this entire semester, right, when we're dealing with an agent. The first thing we need to do is build out that objective function, right, that f of n. I have my state. I have my configuration. How good is it, right? Again, this is where objective function gets different terms depending on wherever, you know, algorithm you were built off or however it was framed. But the big important thing is I could now establish that I want to minimize some f of n. Or I 
maximize some f of n. And that's what we're looking for. So how we can do this is we can start to map these out via those variables and via their domains. Well, hey, you know, that f of n, it's no longer f of n because I happen to have two variables that I'm working off of. I have, oh, there we are. I've got some x and I've got some y that I want to work off of. And since I'll just get rid of min there, right, because I want to maximize it. Again, what am I looking for? Well, this is where now, what's the evaluation function? What's your way of evaluating if an f is better than another f, right? When we were dealing with linear assignment, we just added all the numbers up. Okay, well now we're adding in some form of calculation to it. What am I doing? 25x plus 30y. And you again can see where those combinations are coming into play, right? Everything good so far. Haven't, I know all, all I've done is just showed you a math formula, but I want to make sure. You're, it's math. It's math. But again, we added constraints to this problem. I know, hey, what are my variables? I called them x, that's my trefoil. I have my y, that's my thin mint. And then my domain. for both of them is some number between 0 and 500. Because remember, I have 500 boxes of each. How many do I bring with me? Theoretically, I can bring 0. Theoretically, I can bring 500. Theoretically, I can bring any number in between those two. But I cannot bring 501 because I don't have 501 boxes. The last thing we have to deal with, though, were those constraints. What linear inequalities have to happen such that I can start to do this mapping? I can start to do these configurations. Well, again, I only have 500 of my boxes. Again, this is where this, here's where you, you, know, you really start to map it. Right? This becomes a really fancy symbol. What's that symbol? Say it loud, say it proud. All real numbers, all real numbers. Ugh, right? That's all that, if you really hated that symbol, there you go, all real numbers, right? Oh, but I have my constraints. I have 500 boxes of X and I have 500 boxes of Y and I can only have 800 total. So how do I start to map that? Well, again, if you're starting to think about it from the linear inequality perspective, or how do I take what I'm seeing and represent it into math, I can establish my constraints. X must be less than or equal to, not zero, 500. <laughs> Y can be less than or equal to 500. And that last one, right, that's the very interesting one, is you notice that it's, it can also just be math equations. It's not necessarily that it has to be a single kind of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking A single variable, right? I can also include multiple ones in here. And in fact, that's actually where these things come into play, right? So I can start to map these out, but I want to visualize it first, right? Um, I like to think visually. I like to you know, do all the things that help my brain wrap my head around what I'm doing and why. Well, again, let's think about that first constraint. I have 500 trefoils, right? I have 500 boxes of the trefoil cookie and so if I were to map this out, again, in a two-dimensional plane, this is why we're only working off of two cookies, right? To satisfy this constraint, my x value has to stop at 500. 
Does this constraint care what y is? No, right? So technically, again, if we're thinking about this just visually for a second, I have an infinite vertical jump. I, you know, all of the, any value that I make y doesn't matter. X will be satisfied as long as X is less than 500. And I can do the exact same thing with Y. Notice, again, I have a set of rules. X can be anything. It can be a billion. But as long as Y is less than 500, I meet my, this second constraint. So I've suddenly started to build out a space, right? Notice, everything up here doesn't work, right? Something's too big. Everything's too big, actually, right? Oh, but I've built out this nice little, you know, it's a green square. You can see, hey, hey, I have a space that I can work off of. And I have one final one that I can operate from. And you notice, hey, right, it's a nice little sloping action. What is going on here is if we were to map out that space, uh, just to kind of draw it out a little bit better, just in case it's not really pick, coming up, here is my operating space. I talked about this idea of discretizing or trying to reduce down my search by using constraint satisfaction and establishing this constraint. That's where all my possible configurations exist, right? In this area. Again, what we're trying to do is maximize. Where, what configuration, what setting can I pick such that I found the best one, the biggest one, right? I'm going to go ahead and tell you it's one of these two, right? Here's your optimals uh, that satisfy everything. Uh, and so, you know, you can actually map that, right? Oh, well, hey, uh, if you treated, uh, you know, if you went with uh, less thin mints, or sorry, less trefoils, right? If you went with... Uh, the smaller number of trefoils, you would pull out $122 total. If you went with more trefoils, right, more trefoils, you'd get a profit of $215. Oh, all right. Interesting, yeah. And just to see this in action, again, this is one of the files that you should have access to via Moodle, I already have that in place. And you can see, you know, again, again, I, I've tried my best to give you enough comments to explain what's going on there. I know it's not the best, but I apologize for that. But you can see, hey, nice little mapping. Now, instead of that Y variable, right, you notice that uh, I'm using a different mapping because there is no X and Y, right? Because what happens if I'm dealing with multiple dimensions, right? 10 dimensions, right? So instead of x and y, right, that becomes x1, that becomes x2, becomes x2, x1, x2, x1. Yeah. Right? And other ways that we can take a look at this, you know, as we start to walk through this, you can see, hey, there's that calculation. There's that linear objective function that I want to be working off of as well. Uh, in this case, to represent that via what I'm showing off here, mm -hmm, I'm utilizing the Apache Commons library. Wouldn't it be great if someone has built so many of these things? Because, you know, assignment problems and optimization in business and maximizing profits. Sounds like somebody would want this, like, out there already. Yes, right. So, again, I'm, I'm basing this off of the, uh, that, you know, the Apache Commons version. But you can see, hey, there's that linear objective function. Their parameter specific, yeah, specifically is looking for a list of, or a list, a, an array of doubles. So there's my list of doubles. And then, right, think about what linear inequalities were, right? This is where you got to refresh your math class. What do you do with a linear equality? You set it equal to zero to solve for x, to solve for y. 
Oh, that's right. So I've got the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. That's what those variables are. And then what? Well, there's my constraints. Look at that comment. You know what an array list is. You love array lists, right? Mm -hmm. right? Well, hey, here's a, an array list of constraints that I'm going to be working off of. What are those constraints, pray tell? Again, we have them mapped out on the whiteboard, but we got to code them out. Now, this is where things are shifting from what I put on a whiteboard, and this is why I kind of, when we were doing the linear uh, assignment activity, right, I was like, you can't just, like, hand wave the stuff. You've got to map out every part of it. Because notice my constraint. My first constraint was the trefoils. X1 uh, has to be less than 500. But it's not just X1 less than 500. Because again, that's just a variable. Plus whatever the value of X2 is, is less than 500. But this isn't enough either, right? That's still not quite there. What I'm really looking at, I'm going to just kind of expand this a little bit, right, is, hey, what value? Because then, how do I get rid of this in that, on that linear inequality? Oh, you know, I'm only trying to count my trefoil boxes. I don't care about this one. That's my constraint for the trefoils. Notice, again, there's my double. Only count my trefoil boxes. I don't care about my thin mint boxes. What's the relationship? Less than or equal to. I could have done that. Right? I could have. That wouldn't have been correct. Right? But I have the ability to swap out what kind of relationship. And then specifically, I have a nice little constant here saying that, hey, the less than or equal to should be 500. There's my linear inequality. And you can see I do the same thing with my thin mints. And look at that constraint. Instead of it being 0, 1, or 1, 0, it's 0, 1. Why? Because what did I do? I just did this, I did this, ha-cha-cha, ha-cha, cha-cha. So there you go. And then you can see, hey, I'm doing it one final time with my x1 and x2. Because now, if I'm adding both of them together, again, I have to only fit a certain number in there. Whatever that number of x1s plus whatever that number of x2s has to be less than 800. And there's a new constraint that I've added, right? That's, I've, I've built out a third constraint. And here's where we get into some of the fun parts. Let me minimize you. Right? Oh, hey, is there a solution? Because theoretically, there may not be a solution, right? We're dealing with a lot of moving parts, those numbers, right? You know, uh, or I can't satisfy every single one of my constraints given my problem. This is where you start looking to relax your problems, right? Here's my constraint set. I try and do a try because if I, it will throw an error if there's no solution. But here's where we get into some wonderful parts. Ah, oh, look at that. There is an algorithm for this. It's known as the simplex uh, algorithm. Uh, you can do a Tableau search as well. But the Apache Commons already does it for you. Oh, isn't that nice? Well, your math classes, if you're super into you know, this part, your math classes will explain how to, you know, solve a convex hull linear programming assignment, right? But again, hey, here you go. This thing will do it for you. All you have to do is optimize it. How do you optimize it? You set what kind of goal you're looking for. Here's that objective function. Here's my set of constraints. And this last little bit here is, hey, don't let that be negative. Right? That's it. That's all that last thing is. I know it, 
new non-negative constraint equal true. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't build the Apache Commons. I just, whatever. So again, I, I run it, and there's a nice little, hey, if a solution is found, here's your optimal profit, and here's the mapping to your things. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I got to do one thing with this, math.round. There. And with a fleet of the wrist. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh. But again, why does this matter? Well, what happens if I had shifted my capacity? What happens if I don't have that much right, space? I have a very tiny car. I do not have an SUV. Oh, OK, right? You can see, hey, but I can continue to change this. What happens? Free foils. Well, I'm trying to, this is not a good one. This isn't the best one to try and map over because it was built so simplicity. And there's me just walking through the whole thing. So again, you can see where I get my mappings from. Why I'm flipping through this is, well, that was a very simple problem, right? Oh, okay, you know, just, hey, how many boxes do I put in a spot? And just pick one and fill it all the way. But what if I play it a little differently, right? What happens if I, I took a different product? You, being the college students that you are, are very acutely aware of all the scooters on campus. You have left them in numerous places. Stop leaving them in elevators. I know. Either way, let's say we are manufacturing scooters. OK, fine. And for those of you who've taken the Business 340 class, yes, I blatantly stole this example from them. Hey. I can sell a scooter for $600, get a profit, right, 600 But, you know, the problem is I've seen, again, what your generation does with scooters. And, well, you know, I'm in the business of making money. So I'll make a racing version, right? That way, do your sick trip tricks off of a, I don't know what you would jump. Don't, don't do these. I'm not giving you ideas. My point being, either way, I now have a version That's built for speed. I know. That spoiler took way too much time to build, by the way. You're well. Either way, it's going to give me an $800 profit. But OK, fine. All right, maximize profit again. But herein are my constraints. Hey, I only have a set number of resources. I only have 75 motors. I only have 2,000 labor hours or 80 people uh, you know, in the factory to be working on these things, uh, assuming 40-hour work weeks. You know, have to make, you know. And then I only have 3,000 square feet of metal. I, you know, there's probably more. I'm not adding rubber into this. Or, you know, make my life easier. But these are my constraints. This is my raw goods. right? Well, now we're presenting. The other side of those constraints, I have established, you know, again, the, you know, the, the constant values. Well, both scooters are going to need a motor, so I can only make 75 of these. The normal scooter is going to take me 20 hours of labor to make one, and it's going to cost me 20 square feet of metal. OK, fine. Well, the racing scooter, you know, that's need for speed. But the problem with need for speed is, right, I need to somehow fine tune things, overclock them, or whatever you do to make a thing go faster. I'm a computer person, not a mechanical engineer. Whatever. It takes more time, but less resources, right? OK, all right. Well, again, how do I map this out? How do I kind of build these things out? Again, if I were looking at it from the uh, constraint satisfactions, x1 plus x2 must be less than 75. When we're dealing with labor now, hey, 20 times x1 plus 30 times x1 must be less than 2,000. And finally, that last one, 20 x1 plus 16 times x1 must be less than 3,000. And wouldn't you know it, 
I also have that one readily available for us. Here again, there's my mappings of the racing and normals. Here's my mapping of the same problems all over again. Let's find out which ones. Hold on, let me do the thing again. I'll eventually remember to do this beforehand. There we are. And we run that. Oh, uh, hey, if I want to make a maximum profit, 50 racing scooters. Not all just racing scooters, right? 50 racing scooters and 25 of my normal scooters. But why would I do something like this? Well, we also have the wonderful ability to do what if. What if... I want to bring in three new people, right? I want to bring in three hires. So I have suddenly 40 times three additional labor hours, 120 additional labor hours. How does that change things? Well, now that I have more people, more hours to work from, do I make more racing scooters? Do I focus much more on my racing scooter? Yeah. Make 62 of them, because again, I have more labor hours to be working from, so I should be hiring people and training them on this more specialized version of that model. Likewise, again, forgot to tell you this was a business class. You know, this economy, y'all. Sorry, folks. We're going to have to let 40 of you go. I know. Thank you for coming. Here's your severance package. But what kind of profit are we getting out of that, right? Well, just make normal scooters. Uh, the last little bit there is you can also, just to see this one final time, if you're looking at it from that perspective of just a one hire, how much profit does one hire get me, right? If we looked at the 2000 again, our profit was $55,000, right? Okay, so what does bringing in one person do for our profitability? Do we get more money? Do we make less money? One person is worth $800 to our fake company. Yeah. But hey, again, that's you, know, you, you do the rest of that mapping uh, on your side to kind of plan it out. Where I'll kind of finish things off, the problem set three that I assigned to you today. You could technically build it out and solve it using Apache Commons. You're not allowed to because I'm not going to allow you to, you know, import it. But you could. You can absolutely do that. And in fact, this is, I sat down and did map it. And you can see, hey, if you do, I think this is problem uh, or input one.txt, Here's your configuration to Mac. To, to, there, look, yeah, you can get, you can do that with linear programming. You could solve the entire problem. Don't, you know, 